Welcome to the Talent Equation Podcast. If you are passionate about helping young people to unleash their potential and want to find ways to do that better, then you've come to the right place. The Talent Equation Podcast seeks to answer the important questions facing parents, coaches, and talent developers as they try to help young people become the best they can be. This is a series of unscripted, unpolished conversations between people at the razor's edge of the talent community who are prepared to share their knowledge, experiences, and challenges in an effort to help others get better faster. Listen, reflect, and don't forget to join the discussion at thetalentequation.co.uk. Enjoy the show. Well, today we are trying a little bit of an experiment on the Talent Equation podcast. This is the first time we're going to be doing a, uh, a podcast in front of a live virtual studio audience and... I'm extremely excited to have one of my podcasting heroes on uh, in Rob Gray. Rob, uh, I'm delighted to have you on. Welcome to The Talent Equation. Thank you very much, Stuart. So it's a real pleasure, and uh, this kind of added pressure of a studio audience should be interesting. I'm looking forward to it. Rob's been really, really good, to be a great sport to be, um, I, I do the, as most people know, I do the kind of monthly get-together, the, the, the conclave um, with... Uh, intrepid learners who get together and we've managed to combine two things so basically everybody's listening in to uh, to me and Rob uh, chatting away and at some stage we're going to invite them all to come in and and join in and, and ask some questions of Rob and uh, we're going to see where the conversation goes in true talent equation style um, the, I, Rob I sort of feel like um, we've been on a kind of podcast a parallel podcasting journey on different sides of the Atlantic because we sort of started around about the same time I think and mm -hmm. you've been kind enough to have me on on one of your early ones and I've been very remiss in not having you on so I'm really glad that we're able to kind of reconnect as far as this concern but just be worthwhile I bet maybe, maybe giving everybody a bit of backstory and kind of where you come from and where you, what you've done and then sort of what you, how the podcasting journey has been going. Yeah. So yeah, I start off by saying I, I agree completely. I always, I often recommend yours as like a good compliment to mine. <laughs> You're good. But like I do more of the research academic side, and you do more of the coach practitioner side. We do overlap some, but hmm. I, I think they're good compliments. Yeah. So so I've uh, um, I started the podcast about three years ago um, when I came back to to ASU. Uh, I had to do some, on, I teach some online courses and I need to do some recordings. And um, I was a big fan of podcasts myself because I did, you know, used to do a lot of running, long distance running in the academy company. So I thought, why not put it out to the world? And um, so I, I got the idea of doing it for some of my courses. I started that and it just kind of snowballed. <laughs> um, and, and it really, um, I started kind of more broadly looking at performance in some of the other domains that I work in. So I tend to, I, along with sports, I do stuff in driving safety and aviation, kind of broadly performance psychology. And I started off wanting to do all those things, but it was clear that people were most interested in the sports and coaching side. So I kind of focused on that. And um, it's been unbelievably rewarding how much um, feedback and how many connections I've made with people. It's um, it's, I've really, really enjoyed it, and I definitely plan to continue. So, well, I, lo long may it continue, Rob. I've got to say, <laughs> it's, it's a very important highlight of my week and my commute. To work, <laughs> I have to say so, and I know there's. I, I would not be the. I would not be um, alone in in saying that. I mean, the way you blend kind of that research, also the practitioner stuff, but you're making it accessible as well. It's been fantastic from my perspective and you definitely, definitely opened the doors. In terms of your academic career, you spent some time over here. So kind of just give us the backstory as far as that's concerned. How did you get into your field? Yeah, so I did my, I did all my uh, grads, my uh, college in, in Canada. Uh, I did my PhD. I did a very kind of traditional psychology PhD I did a lot of basic research on visual perception, kind of motion perception for uh, judging like the trajectory of moving objects, some of the like towel related stuff and time to collision. And that was really valuable. And I, I really learned how to be a good experimenter through that, how to, you know, find confounds and, and things like that. But I was always dissatisfied with it kind of because in the language that I use now in, in the podcast, I was doing uncoupled <laughs> experiments, right? I was... 
I was getting people to make ju judgments about these stimuli and they were just pressing buttons, yes or no. So um, I, w I liked what I was doing, but I always wanted to couple it together and, and allow people to act more normally. And so the route that I saw at the time was using simulation and virtual reality um, because I still wanted to have control over the, what I was showing to people, the information they were getting, but um, I wanted them to act in, in a more realistic way. So I wasn't really ready to jump into field experiments at that time. So at that time, there, there wasn't much sports simulation. So I, I, that's when I got into driving and aviation uh, simulation and virtual environments. And then I gradually, over the time, I, I started developing a sports a simulation, in particular baseball batting one. And, and then um, over the years, I used that for a lot of different, different experiments and di to evaluate different aspects of performance and uh, things like choking under pressure, the role of internal, external focus. And, and then I had a brief uh, European tour <laughs> where I, I did a sabbatical yeah, at Marseille, the sports science group there, which was fantastic. And then, I went to the University of Birmingham, where I went to in the sports science department. Um, and I, I also what I tried to do in my career is, is kind of force myself to learn more about the motor side of things. So I was very good on the perceptual side, but I actually kind of forced myself. I actually was ended up teaching biomechanics at University of Birmingham, even though I never took it. <laughs> so I had to kind of teach myself. Um, and that and then uh, for various mostly personal reasons, I decided to come back here. Um, and all, also, I do really enjoy it here. It's really a really good group. Um, so we're actually a psychology program within the engineering school now. So um, I work with a lot of uh, different people. So um, I'm still kind of using lots of virtual environment, but now actually doing more field things and really getting more into skill acquisition thing, type of research than I ever did before. So that's kind of my, my history. <laughs> so is... is is uh, a psychology department within an engineering school is that a fairly unique scenario or is that becoming increasingly prevalent uh it's really really unique our situation there's a uh, there's kind of like uh, s small groups within psychology departments that focus on similar things usually it's called human factors psychology but having it with uh in a, embedded within an engineering department is, is really unique and so, for example, we have a course, uh, our program is called Human Systems Engineering, mm. um, and our, we have a course, it's equivalent to Psych 101, but it's designed for engineers, so to teach them about, so we're trying to teach people to design better systems, better technologies, by giving them, getting them to take into account human capabilities and limitations right from the start, um, instead of designing something and at the end, trying to make it usable, which is the way that we used to do things. <laughs> um, really, you know, let's design things from the bottom up to make them user. And that, that includes training, uh, things like sports and sports technologies as well. And, and so I suppose from that perspective, this is where the ecological thing comes from, because you're kind of working out how the human has to interact with a given task i suppose in a certain environment and working backwards from that in terms of then designing the technology that way yeah definitely that's one of the main things we we teach our students to do in our programs task analysis first you know let's let's break down the problem identify the variables and um you know for example on, on a driving one i was doing recently we, we have a problem here in in the state of arizona with people getting on highways going the wrong way and they, oh, it, as you can imagine, it's quite, it ends up pretty badly. So um, we're trying to figure out why, uh, you know, it's happening and do some research. So I draw actually the constraints triangle, right? What's the task, the individual, the environment? And, um, let's analyze it that way. So, yeah, there's, there's a few of us trying to bring that flavor in. There's definitely the old school <laughs> approach, too, of, uh, you know, mental models and, and more uh, traditional indirect kind of things but there is a few are a few of us that are kind of e more ecological friendly so i'm um, just you uh, you've piqued my interest so um mm -hmm. i know we're you know we're completely off the sports topic but you know we're, we're very eclectic here <laughs> yeah. and, and i'm very I'm, interested firstly why do people drive the wrong way in arizona particularly and then secondly how do you how do you go about analyzing that using the constraints model i'm really interested so the the well part of it, part of it is is simple things like the deep driving intoxicated <laughs> if you rule some <laughs> some of them out um, but there are a certain number a lot of it is because we have such big roads we have like 
six lane highways um, and you have these turns where you're going left turn onto a, a highway where you're in three different lanes that kind of go over a big span. So it's all, it's the affordances of where you're supposed to go are sometimes not very clear. Right. Uh, uh, and I think, so that's the way that we try to, to do, to bring that in, you know, what are the, what are the signs telling you and what are the environmental cues telling you about, where this road is going and sometimes they're not always <laughs> in sync. So um, it doesn't, you know, so it's pretty new stuff, but that's what we're trying to do. And also kind of what do you do with a person once they're on the highway going the wrong way? How do, what, what information tells them they're going the wrong way and, and those kind of things. So, um, so yeah, I think th- there are a lot of problems that are similar in these domains. Definitely. And then, so if you're going about analyzing the problem, you're just looking at it from that perspective, almost like looking at it as if to say, so, what how does the performer interact with the environment and then you're using even like you know affordances as if to say well what, what's attracting people to behave in a certain way and then do you make recommendations about how you might be able to attract people in a different way is that kind of one of the things you might do exactly yeah we try to uh go in and uh, a related thing we do is often we get they can identify intersections where there's a lot of accidents. We try to go in and identify, you know, are, are there visibility issues, Is, you know, and how can we change this? So we change the affordances. Um, definitely. Um, it doesn't always work that simply, but uh, sometimes you can, you, there's clear things you can identify. Definitely. So, um, so to get, getting into the sports realm, um, I mean, one of the things that I'm always fascinated by with your podcast is um, how, how much uh material you get through i mean you've made reference in the past to the mountain of pdfs that there must be Mm -hmm. um but i mean i know partly that you know some of this is about quite producing material like you say because then it helps you with courses and things like that but is this like is this just a a regular flow now in your workflow that you're going to pick up some research and then that's going to go into the podcast or is it, is, does it feature with other stuff that you're doing and then you kind of bring it that way? How do you, how do you work it out? You know, what do you, how do you decide what, you, what, what you're going to do? Is it just stuff that you happen to be researching at the time? Are you, stuff you're interested in? I'm just, just intrigued by that. Yeah, it's a little bit of a mix of all those things. Uh, so sometimes my research drives it and um, it's kind of gone beyond the courses. You know, I've kind of used up uh, all the coursework now. Um, and so a lot of times, and you know, maybe it'll happen today, I get an interesting question from coaches and, and people working in the field. I find they're really good at asking really tough questions. <laughs> the coaches naturally gravitate, gravitate things that are really hard to answer. Yeah. Um, like how, you know, how variable, so how, how demanding should practice be and things like that. So I, I like doing that as well. And, and one of the r- real benefits that it's come for me more recently is it forces me kind of to read in areas that I don't have any reason to otherwise. So uh, last week I did an episode on, on brain stimulation, you know, the kind of halo sport technologies and stuff. And I don't really have any, re- I don't do that kind of research. So I would never have reason to dig into all those papers, but if I make it a, that's a topic, <laughs> then, then it gives me motivation. So that it's a good side effect for me um, to try to keep on top of areas that I don't directly do research in. But it is it's it's really random it goes it goes through it, it, i'm sure you're the same where periods where i have pretty good plan and then I'm the week of um what should i talk about today but um so it's a little bit of all those things definitely and uh, so one of the things i'm kind of intrigued in is sort of what is the kind of area within sports research that is your kind of what's a, what's what's attracting you at the moment what's the thing that you're kind of really digging into and finding some really interesting stuff and actually what 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 are you researching at the moment that might be of interest most of it's probably going out on the podcast so we can always get them to go and listen to that but <laughs> but you know kind of what are the things that, you, that, that that are you know that you're kind of you're finding interesting and you think that you know is could be sort of the next thing that we begin to start to explore in more detail in an applied sense yeah, I guess there's a couple things that I've been trying to do. Um, one is I've, I've been trying to do, to do I've got one, one study coming out soon and one that I'm writing up now where I'm trying to directly, trying to make as much as you can direct comparisons between different coaching methods, right? So to try to identify the relative merits of things. Um, 
So you often see, you know, the like if you pick constraints led approach versus traditional instructional approach and people get on arguments online about which way is better and and you really find there's no research that compares these kind of things directly. Um, so um, for example, I have a, a baseball one coming out where I tried the best as I could to directly compare using internal focus of attention instructions, external and a constraints manipulation to, to try to get baseball batters to, to hit the ball with a higher in higher in the air, which is something that a lot of players are trying to do now. So I've done that. And then also uh, writing up a paper where we looked at a differential learning versus a constraints led approach. So, so I think trying to, trying to compare and contrast what these different methods do and you know, how they differ um, is one thing that I want to try to do. I, I see that as kind of a real gap in, 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 in the field now. Um, aside from comparing internal versus external focus of attention instructions, which has been done a ton, um, I don't see a lot of the other comparisons. So, so that's one thing. Um, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I was just going to ask actually about that. Um, you mentioned differential learning versus constraint. So for somebody who doesn't know what differential learning is, mm -hmm. how, would you, how would you categorize that? So, um, so the way that I like to, to think of it is, is uh, constraints-led approach is a more uh, principled kind of uh, manipulation of the environment to, tr to try to make you, you more variable, but in a very planned kind of way. Um, whereas differential learning is kind of variability for variability's sake. And mm -hmm. the analogy I used in, in one of my episodes is, is a buffet, right? Yeah. So if, if, you are, if you have someone, you know, a person that eats hamburgers for dinner every day, and you're trying to get them to get a better diet, um, you take them to a Las Vegas buffet, and a, a constraint-sided approach would be, okay, you're only allowed to eat from this end of the buffet, <laughs> the seafood <laughs> section. And the idea is that by kind of constraining what you can do, we're going to force you to come a new solution. You might find new food that you like, that, that kind of thing. So, but we're, we're choosing a particular uh, kind of set of options, and we know what we want, and um, like in a sports example, you know, typically like small-sided games. We know what we're, we're trying to get you tuned into, you know, the sp spacing of players and things. So whereas differential learning would be try – we want you to try every single food on the, on the buffet. We want you to go through the full range of maximum possible variability. So if you look at some of the differential learning studies, they'll have people do the craziest things like, I want you to take this next shot with your left foot up and one eye closed and your hands. <laughs> right. So this is kind of my interpretation. I think this is consistent with what it, they really do, but the, a lot of it's not very principled. It's just getting you to try lots of different body postures with the hope that some way you're going to latch on to, to, um, to finding something, a new solution that works for you and, and things like that. So, so that's how I would, I would distinguish the two of them. They're both trying to get more variability in your movement, get you to, they're both around self-organization. So there's a lot of similarities. It's just, um, you know, the way that you go about it. I really like that idea of just kind of, I love the way you categorize that, you know, so, you know, constraints is like eating the buffet, but from one end of the table towards the end. Yeah. And I, <laughs> Because, I mean, just using buffets as an example, I'm at the amount of times I've been on a holiday and there's a buffet and, you know, you end up with like this ridiculous <laughs> combination of food. Yes. You know, so it's a sort of similar model. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah you can, it is, uh, it, it's definitely uh, some the constraints go in other parts of your life too, outside the field. So, um, but, so I think that's important. Be, it, one of the concerns that I, I have a bit with like the constraints that approach and ecological dynamics is, that people miss that principled part of it, right? They, they, think, they read, oh, you, you just manipulate the size of the field or change the ball, or, and they think that it's just kind of willy-nilly, and they run off and do it, and it doesn't work. Um, so I think people miss the part where you need to understand what the information is and, and, and do it in kind of a principled way. So I worry sometimes that it, it, you know, people are trying it, but not in quite the right way. Um, so I, I, I think that's, that's an important message. And um, going back to the, uh, the, the model you had previously where you were talking about the difference between the kind of internal focus of attention, the external focus of attention, and the, and the constraints-led approach, mm -hmm. why three? So if we, because often I think, quite often it's about a comparison. So why are you looking at the three of them in, di in, in 
the round, if you like. Yeah, I'm not sure why I, I did. I was just kind of, so I've done the internal, external before. And um, I guess the, you know, the way that we traditionally do it, I didn't, I, I was I wasn't sure there would be a big difference between external and constraints uh, the way that I was doing it. So I kind of wanted one that would be a big contrast. Um, um, yeah, I don't know if there was a particular reason I did that, but, um, I th- and it was, it was kind of an easy condition to add to, to just slightly vary the instructions to make them internal or external. But. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, there's an interesting, I mean, just, just digging into that. I mean, I've, mm. I've followed Gabby Wolf's work for quite a long time mm. and obviously the various stuff that you, that you've been doing, but I, I still feel like there's, there's a, a bit of an ongoing debate about internal versus external focuses of attention. I wonder if you wouldn't mind kind of, I guess, expanding on the debate and then maybe mm. where do you come, where, where do you sort of fit into this? Yeah, I, I've really kind of changed my course on the, this over the years. And um, yeah, so if you read the literature, you get the clear message that internal focus of attention cues are horrible. They're almost always worse. So anyway, referring to an athlete's body um, when, when they're, you're instructing them is bad. And depending on who you read, it de- might depend a little on skill level, right? It's really bad for experts. And some, depending, there's somewhat of an argument whether it's bad for uh, novices or or novices Um, but in general there's this message pretty strong like there's yeah there's 20 plus years of Gabby's work and and you know I've added to that and stuff too and so that's one side of the coin but then you go and talk to experienced coaches and they they're like no we use those all the time right (laughs) and they work fine and then and and I you know I think and I've talked to a few you know some of the coaches at Altus here and it's been really instructive and I think there's two major limitations with the research that's really showing that internal cues don't work well. Is one is that the way that you typically do a study is you you pick a set of cues like I'm going to tell a long jumper to focus on their knee, right? And what you do is you give those to everybody. So the first thing you're doing that experienced coaches don't do is you're not individualizing the key, like good coaches individualize cues to each athlete right that's what they're that's part of their major expertise so we never do that in, in the in the studies um and the other the other major thing is the uh, most of the studies including some of my own and all of gabby's is we as experimenters are doing the cueing coming up with the cues not really experienced coaches so I'm really, I don't know how to exactly to test this, but I really strongly believe if you got really experienced coaches that could individualize the internal focus of attention cues, the, the difference between them would not nearly be what we're portraying in, in the, the literature. So, so I think, they're va- so I think they're, they have a bad rap. I also think it's good to try to explore lots of different types so if you are a coach that uses uses lots of internal cues i think it's used trying useful to try to let's try to make this external external cue instead and just to see what it does and give it different options for the athlete so so i think you know you just want to kind of have a big toolbox of, of different different methods so that that's kind of where i sit right now <laughs> it's interesting because one of the things um i found with that whole conversation mm-hmm. is um i mean it, it kind of makes intuitive sense uh particularly with things like target sports mm-hmm. so i know a lot of the research is done for example in things like golf with putting uh, mm-hmm. or darts or those sorts of things you know and, and all that sort of stuff but then i think when when the dynamics change as in there's lots of other variables i.e opponents that can do other things then th- those sorts of things kind of change but i think I think the point I've always considered is, is that um, I think what a lot of coaches would do is make somebody aware of a body movement as in a physical movement of their body, which we would, we would refer to as an, an internal cue, I suppose, mm-hmm. um, kind of without thinking about it. And then in so doing the individual becomes more focused on the movement of the body than the movement of whatever implement they happen to have or whatever it is that's then going to propel the object that they're trying to propel. Mm-hmm. And of course it's always, so for example, I've always thought if you're a, if it's in a, you know, a kind of a, uh, you've got a racket or a stick or a, or a bat or something like that, then the, the focus probably needs to be a bit more towards that. Mm-hmm. Um, 
than, for example, the bit of you that is trying to make that that object work. But I always thought it was really, really weird. So, for example, for a long jumper, for you to give be able to give external cues, there must be some elements of internal cues that that individual must become aware of because the the actual thing that they're trying to propel is their body. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's kind of slightly different, but I, I don't know. Am I, am, I, am I oversimplifying that? Yeah, no, no I, I agree with you. Yeah, it does disp- depend on the sport a lot. Um, someone like, uh, uh, like Gabby's work would argue, like with a long jumper, what you, you, you really, and it's amazing that this does make a difference. I've, I've found this in my research is, you know, obviously they need to know about their feet, hmm. but if you want them to do something with your feet, you cue them about their shoes. Yep. or the force that they're putting onto the ground, yep. which changes it from an internal, their body. to the, so, so you can get at the body kind of indirectly by referring to it. Um, there's, there's a couple other things um, I think are kind of factors here is, is when do you do it, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, oftentimes we just make this blanket statement about this internal focus on your body being bad. But that, yeah, maybe in competition, you don't want to do that. But when you're in practice and trying to modify something and refine it, you do want to get in there. So putting it all in. And then the other thing is what you focus on. Um, I've started to find, and other people have found this as well, you know, there's a difference between getting you really to focus on the mechanics of it versus some more holistic part of the movement, like rhythm or fluency like that, that, although that's about your movement and about your body, it seems to be uh, not as, as bad. And, and, and athletes, especially experienced athletes, seem to be more attuned to that as well. So, so I think there's more to this story, definitely, than the simple dichotomy of internal, external. Yeah. And sort of going back to where we started the conversation in terms of where you want your research interest to go, which is to be much more, I, I guess, working backwards from the environmental challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, I suppose part of the challenge we have is actually the limitations of our research and our experimental design. Mm -hmm. And so the more real world we can become with the limitations that that brings with it, the better we're going to be able to answer some of these questions. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, I think so. I think there's a couple issues there and, and, um, one of the, you know, things that kind of irks me, (laughs) I see a lot on social media and stuff is, uh, people critiquing, you know, there's no evidence to support, the constraints that approach to coaching. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's true. People have been, been manipulating sizes of soccer pitches for a long time, but the actual ecological dynamics and Keith David's constraints that approach has not been around long enough <laughs> in research terms and publication terms to have a large body of evidence. So that's kind of a ridiculous critique. But, but the other thing that's related to that is, if we believe kind of a lot of this this ecological approach, then we're we're really gonna we're, what we're saying is that uh, skill acquisition is highly nonlinear and highly individual. None of the methods that we traditionally use in research, either design or statistics, which are all group based and linear, <laughs> assuming normal distributions, are going to work. Right? If everybody learns in a different way, we can't do an analysis of variance or a t-test, which lumps them all and looks at their mean. Right? So, so we need we do need to come up with new research methods and and in also yes, like more representative uh, design and and more complexity. Um, you know, m- moving away, we're, you know, motor learning research, there's a lot of great motor learning research on key pressing and, you know, really, really simple tasks. And um, the, we need to get it up to multiple degree of freedom coordination. <laughs> and I- even in our golf, you know, there's a reason everybody does golf setting studies. It's <laughs> easy, <laughs> right? It's easy to control, but you know, there's, we need, to, you're right. We need to get more representative. Definitely. The, I think the, the thing for me, uh, just on that kind of whole can of worms around mm-hmm. evidence, is like you say, um, I think part of the reason is there isn't, I actually think there's a, there is a fair amount of, I suppose, it, it, you, maybe not direct uh, evidence, but what there is, is an increasing body of um, various studies that are pointing in this direction. And the thing that I'm triangulating with might not even be triangulating it's always triangles isn't it um uh is uh the 
audience that you have, the audience that I have of practitioners who've been trying it a different way and not been having a great deal of success and are now thinking there's got to be some alternatives out there and are now looking to the ecological approach and actually it's it's kind of resonating with them. They're going, yes, this is kind of what I've been missing. This is the bit that I haven't had here. And now they're, they're kind of sort of stepping into that direction. And I think that's kind of the interesting and exciting bit. And we almost need a means by which I think it's probably not beyond the realms of possibility for us to almost use technology to almost like crowdsource a range of experiences to be able to get, we almost need somebody to go out and do the same kind of game activity for the same people that we could, we could almost do it, get everybody mm-hmm. out there doing it, come back and then feed in their findings and then sort of crunch it through a gigantic, you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, we could use uh, machine learning to then tell us what is this telling us? Yeah. But we definitely do need some different approaches. Yeah, no, I, I do. I agree. And, yeah, you're right. There's lots of small pockets and it's probably all do it slightly different ways. So it's hard to compare, but yeah, no, I do. And, and I should, you know, I'm not like a ecological psychology or a zealot. I wouldn't put myself, I've come about it and I'm still very critical of a lot of aspects about, of it. I've come around about to it and I like some aspects, but I like, I think it misses some other, other points, but um but I do, I agree with you. I always point that out to people. There's a reason people get attracted to, to it. I, I, I was the same when I first read Gibson. It just it resonated. That's the ba- exact word I would use. There's, it wasn't made things easier or just made more. It just resonated with me, um, some, of the, with some of the things. And I think that's true with a lot of coaches as well. Yeah, because um, I think, and, and don't get me wrong, um, mm-hmm. Uh, there's been things in the past that have resonated with me that have turned out to be just flat wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and there are sometimes things that are in, you know, feel intuitively like they ought to be, you know, kind of right. But in reality, you know, just because of the nature of us as human beings and behavior and complexity and all these sorts of things, definitely, you know, that, that, that aren't right. But when an increasing group of what I would consider to be, advanced practitioners kind of all start moving in a certain direction you sort of go to yourself aha you know maybe there's something to this yeah (laughs) yeah no definitely and it's nice to see uh um that kind of movement and and um one of the things that's been really nice to see kind of in my career is part of it's technological social media it's so much easier to share things but um, all the the like really top coaches, a lot of them. I'm sure that you're thinking of the same names that I am. They're they're so. Uh, it's kind of changed in, in coaching now, where you you had to protect your your methods to be successful. To now, the really top ones share everything. <laughs> it seems yeah. like they tell everyone what they're doing, and it's by being really open and disseminating. So I think that's kind of helping too. People latch on to this, and and um, yeah, no, I agree. It, it, it is a nice kind of movement. I, you know, we we had a couple conferences this this a uh, few months ago that kind of were movement, <laughs> part of this movement. So yeah, it is nice to see um, whether it you know it's the greatest way. I think it's definitely something that deserves more effort put into to evaluating and testing it. Um, in it, so I think that's important. What I actually love about the, the the community is is that I sort of all I felt for a long long time that the academic community that was kind of leading on coaching research and the practitioners it felt to me like there was quite a separation mm-hmm. and um, and that's partly due to the inaccessibility in terms of some of the research things quite inaccessible for some people but also I think it's to do with the fact that we didn't have the means by which to share the learning so practitioners mm-hmm. couldn't actually go oh I've read this and actually. I think it kind of means this for me as a practitioner and you're getting a lot more of that sort of stuff happening, which I think is really helping people and and hopefully quite valuable. But I think the other thing is, it feels to me anyway, that uh, people who are kind of researching in and around the ecological space just, just seem to be kind of really keen to share what they're learning. I'm thinking of people like, you know, Tim Buzzard, who's Mm -hmm. been actually, you know, actively sort of, um, you know, almost like interpreting uh, Mm -hmm. some of the academic stuff and putting it out there in, in, you know, relatively kind of bite-sized ways and, and Ben Galloway with his stuff on YouTube, you know, and they're kind of just saying, look, I've read this stuff. I'm going to put it out there because this is what I think it means. And other people might find that of interest. 
and mm-hmm. and then people you know who have been at this game for a lot longer such as yourself and Keith and uh, Ian Renshaw and people like that you know only too happy to share experiences and learning with with practitioners and for me that's and and it's that kind of very sort of open sharing community that I have to say I find really quite attracting attractive because it it's uh, you feel like you're part of a bit of a community of of people who are just happy to learn together some through practice some through research some through a combination of both yeah no I agree and I really like that too and and I try to emphasize you know with myself that I like uh, you know Keith's the model example I think of this right (laughs) Keith values coaches knowledge as much as his own like he does not put himself up on a pedestal that he knows everything I, I think that that sets a great example and and also that knowledge flows both ways like we're not standing up here giving you all the answers you're helping define it you know practitioners are helping define it so yeah i think that's really nice it hasn't always been that way in the in the ecological psychology um it was very uh you know a lot of it was about philosophy and epistemology and i was very frustrated with the field for a long time because it it, you know, Gibson's dream was to understand real world things. Mm. You know, he studied, talked about uh, landing an aircraft and, and doing all these things. And for some long time, the field got stuck in manipulating pendulums and <laughs> things that were easy to describe with dynamical systems, which was valuable. Like, like work like Scott Kelso is, is, you know, really important, but it never quite got to the to the real thing. It took a while, and and for that reason, it was kind of, it was kind of a closed thing for a while. But I agree with you; it's really nice. It's it's starting to get this momentum. So you made you made reference to the conferences. So I was fortunate enough to um, enjoy the hospitality over in Cork of uh, mm-hmm. Ed Colin uh, and and the guys. And mm-hmm. you were we did the. Um, we did the whole sort of transatlantic experiment of of having a conversation across the across the uh, the oceans, uh, and you were with Carl Newell with um, uh, Sean Mishka and his colleagues over there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, interested just to get your reflections on basically you know going in there in a room full of practitioners and the questions they were asking and all those sorts of things. Yeah, I know. So it was great. And unfortunately, I had to sneak out early for personal <laughs> stuff, but, but I, I, I really did enjoy it. A couple uh, things, while I was overwhelmed by the size, there was, we had a great turnout. The room was full and it was, and I'm continually overwhelmed and, and um, by the level of information that practitioners want. Um, I really, I have to tell this to all my guests now that like when I have academics on and I interview them, I have to tell them, don't dumb it down at all. Mm. These guys want all the, <laughs> they want to know all the nitty gritty of the research and all the terminologies of, um, and you know, guys and girls. So I, I think that's like, that's the same thing I got at the conference, you know, questions I get and, and you know, I, I love, you know, I love the mix of things, you know, we're getting a, a lot of, prof- depending on the sport, um, in the main sport I, I work on in baseball is great. Like I think half of the, at least half of the major league teams had a representative at Sean's conference, which was, wow. was amazing. Uh, they're so open and, and, and that, that's really been a change in my career too. So yeah, I, I think it's, and I think it's really valuable and I, I like, um, I think also a couple of the academics, um, I can't remember, like Carl and I talked to, and they were, you know, that people are actually using this stuff that they do. They're, they're really, really happy uh, that, that this, this is kind of thing's happening. Um, I, I agree entirely. And, and, that, and I think that's the bit I think I was trying to allude to earlier on, which yeah. was this idea, I think, because I think the, some of the uh, researchers knowing the limitations of some of the research design are kind of actively looking for practitioners to go out there and test stuff and to almost like come back with the field notes. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I do see that and, and get feedback on whether this makes sense. <laughs> you know, I really appreciate that. You know, we're talking to people like Sean is, you know, am I way off by a rock <laughs> line here? You know, that they, would a coach really ever do this? Because I don't know. I don't, coach regularly or anything so so that helps as well definitely brilliant well um my uh my virtual studio audience have been um very patient um so i'm going to open the floor to them to be able to come in with some questions um 
I know, I know we've got quite a few guys who are involved with football, so you might get some football related questions. Um, but um, yeah, I'm going to go with a, like a, a hands up uh, based on the guys because they're all patient. They've all been very, very diligent and they've all muted themselves. So who wants to jump in first with a question for Rob? Um, I'll, I'll give it a go. Yeah. Otherwise, <laughs> we'll just be working with awkward silence, right? <laughs> it doesn't make a very good like, podcast. <laughs> yeah, it's like class. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so Rob, one of the things I was I was thinking about as you as you were talking about um, different approaches and such, and you know, talking through um, your internal and external focus of attention, constraints based, and and all that, I was wondering what where what's the research like? Is there any research out there that looks at um, defining what success is in coaching? Um, I've seen some from Gene Cote, and I, I probably just butchers his name. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was, I think just the way we talk about with a constraints based approach, we have to understand what we're looking for. What's the end goal, end goal, what's the outcome. I, I wonder, is there, is there any research out there that says, well, what, what should it, what should the, when you come away from your session, what's the framework to say, well, we've had success there on a, a short, medium and long-term basis. If that, does that make sense? Yeah, no, that, that's a really good and difficult <laughs> question. Uh, that's a really important question. Right. That we do. No, no, it's, you know, it's, um, you know, there's kind of multiple, you know, it kind of starts with the, you know, the, the basic of it that we always talk about in mode learning research is, is separating performance and learning. So looking good in practice performance is not necessarily an indication of learning long-term improvement. So, so that's, you know, one thing we want to move beyond that. Um, so we kind of have, you know, the traditional way we define it in research is kind of a pre post training. Is there improvement? How does that compare to a control group? But some of the other ways that I think are important to, to show are, um, you know, some example of retention, you know, the, 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 the things we do in practice stick, um, which is, is not always the case. And, and also some sort of transfer, you know, is it what we're doing in practice? Does it transfer to more complex conditions, different conditions than, than practice? So, so the, the, the basic way that we do define it in, in research is performance based, you know, some simple thing like putting, how long, how far the ball ends up from the hole or number of hits or, or, or things like that. And I realized that, you know, we can't always do that in, in, um, in coaching, you, you can't always do simplify it that way. So an, another way that we try, you know, more process-based kind of metrics are, are you getting kind of the, the patterns of movement you want and, and things. But um, I definitely think that is an area where we need to, to come up with more ways of, of evaluating success. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned earlier, if we really believe it's going to be nonlinear, you know, you might get, you know, uh, you're, doing the right thing, but you're not seeing anything and you're the flat part of the, the trajectory. And then you suddenly get this improvement. So it, it is a really difficult problem, I acknowledge. Do you want to come back on that, Scott? Or uh, is that, a, is that a, a, good, a good response to your extremely difficult question? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I, think it may, I, think it's a, I think it's a good answer. Um, I think the hard thing, and I, I work in soccer, so the hard part is... <laughs> In, in what is really so varied and random and, and often subjective um, is if we look at retention of skill, um, to, it's, a, it's hard to get an, a, an effective and um, quantifiable measure. But no, I think retention and transfer from um, is, is a good place to look, work, start from. And, and definitely something I talked to about with my coaches about is the difference between learning and performance and, and looking at the big picture as a, for your, uh, for your success measures rather than the immediate. So I appreciate it. It's good. Thank you, Scott. Uh, right. So, uh, Rob, we're moving over to, uh, Phil, who is a BMX coach. Phil, am I right? In, are you, are you UK or are you New yeah, you- London based? London based. Yeah. But you're a, a New Zealander based in London. Is that right? Correct. Yes. I wasn't sure whether it was like 8, 8.45 in the morning for you over in, in New Zealand. No, no. 
No. So, Rob, uh, Phil's got a question for you. Fire away, Phil. Yeah, so, Rob, um, I've been coaching a group of kids now for two or three years, and BMX is a sport, or in my observation, we seem to be attracting quite a few kids that have, you know, mild additional needs or, you know, on autistic, either on an autistic spectrum, but predominantly the ones I'm coaching currently now, uh, two out of the three sort of older group of boys I'm coaching, uh, you know, clinically diagnosed with ADHD, um, and one of them also presents with dyslexia and things like that. And obviously, I've found some challenges in coaching with them. Um, we're very fortunate. We've got a young Canadian girl who's doing a master's in sports psychology at Roehampton, so she's working with them. And I've noticed, you know, very not I wouldn't say drastic, but a very noticeable difference in the uptake of you know their perception of those skills but it's also i've also noticed on the physical side so i was just wondering on what model or you know ecological model constraintly and type learning you could recommend or any ideas or research out there that may help because obviously they do pick up the skills mm. but it seems to be a lot more you know a lot more repetitive or they have a slower uptake and or they need to repeat it a lot more before they can pick it up. But again, they're, they're still very skillful, um, but it's also just trying to keep their attention during the training periods as well. Yeah, no, I think that that's an interesting question. Um, there, there, there is a kind of a bunch of research trying to relate kind of basic attentional abilities, like uh, your ability to inhibit actions uh, that are inappropriate, um, your biz ability to kind of stay on task and be vigilant and, and not be distracted. And, and to, to, you know, some of the work uh, Mark Wilson's group in Leeds at um, Exeter has uh, done those kind of things, looking at that kind of training and evaluation and how it relates to performance. So I, I think that's there. And I, um, I, I would think, you know, that's, you know, where on the, it's kind of a double-edged sword, the constraints. On the one hand, you're not asking them to sit there and digest a whole bunch of instruction um, that m they might lose attention and not focus on. You're letting them kind of come up with their own solution and, and respond to your constraints. But then again, and this is a problem with all constraints that approach, what do you do if they get stuck? And, you know, self-organization, what do you do if it's not happening, right? And, and I always, uh, you know, my recommendation is to quickly move on to something else, you know, in, and I think maybe in that case, you need to do that a bit, even a bit quicker if they're not staying engaged and, um, you know, it's not leading to them finding what you want. So, but yeah, that, that's a tricky problem, uh, um, kind of dealing with those kind of special needs, definitely. Phil, Phil my, my, I'm just going to chip in on that one. Oh, yeah. my, ex, my experience of working with uh, kids with a range of different, um, uh, uh, I guess, uh, impairments or disabilities, if you like, um, uh, including... Um, things like attention deficit um has been that um when i've used in the past particularly more I mean, I kind of say you know instructional where you know kind of uh, very sort of solution focused you know there is an answer to this and you know you just got to just follow the the prescription i found that the engagement levels to be much much lower whereas when it's much more around a problem solving approach and there's much more scope for ways of solving the problem and exploration i've actually found that that's been far better from an engagement perspective now that's engagement learning i honestly couldn't tell you um i didn't really look at it from that perspective i was coming at it from the participation angle so i was looking at it from engagement but a part of me felt if we got the engagement bit right we could kind of let the learning take care of itself um but i don't know whether that's uh, that's uh, answers any of you answers that question um do you want to come back? Have you got any kind of follow up to that? Yeah, well, no, it's, it's definitely helpful. And it, it's interesting because there's like two of them are great friends. And, you know, the one that hasn't got ADHD is hot on the tail of the other one. The <laughs> other, other guy's a bit, you know, more sure of himself. But you can see the confidence of the other guy is rising. And, you know, along with that, his, you know, his physical skills and stuff are rising quite, you know, at a higher, you know, he's on a, you know, better trajectory 
you know, if you, you know, to graph them out. So yeah, it's something I'm sort of following quite interestingly, but you know, they're both at that sort of, you know, age now where they're going through the, you know, um, puberty, the growth spurt. So, you know, their strength is increasing and all that sort of stuff. So they're, they're dealing with that as well. Um, so yeah, no, it, it has been helpful. Thank you. So uh, we're now going to move over to Brian, who's on your side of the pond. Um, uh, Rob, he's a football coach. He'll tell you where he's from because I'm a rubbish host and I've completely forgotten. Um, so Brian, jump on in. All right. Hi, guys. Um, I'm actually in the Dallas, Texas area. Okay. Right? Uh, so not terribly far from you. Yeah. Um, in relative terms, Brian. I mean, yeah, well, we're in a tiny you, little island here. Yeah. In the US, <laughs> <five countries. laughs> uh, so probably kind of a two-part question. As you guys were talking about before, I think on the practitioner side, there's definitely a community coming around these ideas. Uh, and it's, you know, it's showing up on the field. But as we move up to organization or governing body kind of level. I think that's where they start looking for that data coming out of your arena, Rob. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder if you see anything on the horizon that kind of pushes that out to the next level as far as study design or anything like that, that, that really can convince at that higher level. Uh, and then maybe follow up to that is if we see a team sport that's a little more complex, but, more stripped down than say soccer like baseball is really grabbing onto this you know does that present chances for you guys to really get in there and take a look at this and have you know boots on the ground kind of data yeah i think i think there are some growing opportunities and i've definitely you know i've had uh some opportunities recently to to work directly with teams and um i don't know how much of that is going to get out <laughs> unfortunately when you get working with a high level teams you know the the chance that you're going to be able to publish something or the data is going to come out is gets lower and lower, obviously. And, and we also get in the problem of really small numbers. Um, and I, I think one of the areas that I, I would like to see our field move and is to do more case study instead of these big, where you have big groups and you try to compare them, you know, if you really want to study really elite athletes and get in there with the teams doing individual case studies of people, I think, are, and there's some journals that are starting to come out that support that. So I think that's one route with that. So, um, yeah, it, re it really is sports specific. Um, in my career, it, it's really changed. And I used to just find the one or two coaches that were open to sports science kind of ideas and latch onto them <laughs> for dear life. But, um, I don't know what it what it is. It's it's the you know the analytics movements kind of in sports help eventually, but so I don't know what it's going to take in in, in the other kind of team sports as well. Um, I don't know if that answered your yeah. Uh, again, I'll 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 chip in. Uh, it may not be the case in the U.S., but certainly here in the U.K., um, some of the the big bigger participation or bigger uh, governing bodies have uh, well, I'm not going to say 100, percent but but jumped in to the ecological space in a very, very big way and remodeled their curricula, remodeled their coach education, uh, you know, early stages still. Um, but I mean, certainly the sport I'm involved with hockey, I mean, they're like uh, almost a hundred percent ecological, uh, in the, in their kind of philosophy, the way they co educate coaches, uh, the approach they're taking, you know, and, and I think part of the reason for that is that they firmly believe in, uh, two things. One is, it's way more fun <laughs> for the kids. <laughs> they have a far better time. And secondly, the belief, and actually I think they're prepared to take this step because they're going to get the benefit participation wise anyway. And the belief is that that, that will also over a period of time produce a uh, far higher caliber of athlete or, per, or, or player. So they sort of feel like this is kind of the ultimate win-win model. Um, Others, I suppose, that are a bit more, uh, the dynamic sports particularly have moved in this direction. The other sports that are sort of more kind of what you might call kind of CGS, centimeters, gram, seconds type sports, I think have been a little bit slower, but uh, they're coming on board, um, well, or beginning to come on board as they see some of the others move in this direction as well. So it's kind of interesting uh, how, how that's happening. Sorry, Brian, I, I just uh, hijacked that answer there a bit. But. No, it's good. <laughs> yeah, I have less contact probably with governing bodies and things than, than you do, Stuart. So um, I'm not sure kind of what, what the, the vibe is there. Yeah. Um, 
Is that, that, is that good for you, Brian? Yeah, I think so. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, now we're over to Christian. You had a question for Rob as well. You got to unmute. Sorry, Christian, you got to unmute. I forgot to tell you. That's how I normally sound. <laughs> <laughs> what, when you're at school? Soft spoken. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> For my students here. Um, so I, I feel like I am uh, drinking from the fire hose a bit, so I'm leaking water everywhere. I'm just trying to run my head around a lot of these ideas. But, um, so I'm thinking about the ecological approach uh, mm-hmm. it, and, um, and hearing conversations a lot about, about developing youth uh, players. So mm-hmm. that, you know, there's there are this you know child development and brain development and physical changes that kids go through to tie into all of these concepts. It's, it's just seems so complicated. Mm-hmm. One thing in particular that I'm thinking about is when we have our youth players play. So in the in, in the United States, um, I think our, our my generation growing up and playing soccer, we had a, a deficiency of knowledge about soccer, and so our parents and our coaches would um, in a way they sort of default to an ecological approach. I mean, they do the drills, I think for just, that's what they think they're supposed to do, but the kids are learning through the game and the parents are learning through the game in the sense that uh, we traditionally as kids, we tell the, we tell the team, all right, kick it long to the fastest player who will run a score goal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're not developing players for the more advanced game, but they are solving problems for the immediate game. So it's, it's a weird um, um, interplay between what, how the ecological approach can actually develop uh, future athletes that, that can thrive in a sport. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if, that, if this is making a whole lot of oh. sense, but just I'm trying to wrap my head around that. Yeah, no, I think there's, there's this distinction to be made, and there's, there's a couple of good, good papers on this, um, on – teaching using game-based instruction, sometimes called teaching games for understanding and the ecological approach, um, which is teaching games for my understanding is let the game be the teacher will just play and, and, and will develop skills. Whereas ecological approach, like I was, I was trying to say uh, before is hopefully more principled. So you're getting at, you know, this is a specific skill I want them to develop decision-making and passing. So, the information that people use when they decide whether to pass in soccer is the spacing between players. So I'm going to manipulate the game in a certain way to enhance, now augment that information. If I put everybody close together, <laughs> they're really going to experience that, that spacing. And so I, th- I think that's part of the difference that we've seen, uh, you know, this kind of, you can get those higher level behaviors, um, if you're, you know, you need to understand what you're aiming for rather than let's just let them play. It's fun. They'll, 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 they'll pick up the skills. So, so I think that that's part of it. Um, and actually youth, youth sport is one of the areas where I, in the constraints approach is really, I think, established, there's really good evidence in particular in the form of scaling equipment and scaling the field for kids, which is, which is an example of manipulating constraints. Um, there's lots of good research from tennis, you know, use smaller rackets and balls that don't bounce as high, get way better development in basketball, things like that. So, so I think, you know, this kind of approach is definitely, you know, a, a, an area where there's, there's good evidence that it works, um, particularly that aspect of it. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. Uh, um, and yeah, Christian, I, I, I obviously echo that. I think this is actually an area that, um, I think a lot of people maybe are getting wrong. They're sort of confusing various things. So I've definitely heard people talking about kind of the ecological approach or a constraints led approach. Um, but they kind of just think that I'll just let the kids play. And that is quite different. And this is the bit that I think people often miss is that, uh, the constraints led approach, particularly as a sort of like, as a methodology for coaching, uh, has a lot of intention. So you have to be quite clear about what it is that you're trying to work on. It can't just be like the buffet example that Rob used and I'm going to be using or everywhere I go now, Rob, I'll be using that. (laughs) It's not just come and come and take something from the buffet and let's see, see see how that tastes. It's actually saying, here's something for you to have a, have a little, little chew on. 
and uh, and then we might move on to the next thing, the next course, by adding in some extra flavour, and then we'll put some more spices on the top of that. And I've got to stop it with the food metaphors. Yeah, yeah. Um, time, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, anyway. <laughs> but it's that whole. Um, and you said this right at the start, Rob, and I think this is something I took away as well about this, the task analysis first. You need to analyse the task and then work out the constraints you're going to use in order to help somebody sort of perform at the task. If that's mm-hmm. is that a fair fair uh, reflection? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think the the model example that's really good is if you look at the work like Keith and people like Duarte Arugio have done on soccer and rugby, um, where they really show what drives decisions and actions in rugby is like the interpersonal spacing between players and when it gets to a critical point. And what they basically show is in traditional practice with a big field, number of times that happens is, is hardly ever, right? So that's why, in, like, like in a real soccer match, you get these brief moments where decide games, where these critical, and kids, if you don't, if you put it on a regular field, you're not getting the experience of that information in that situation. So, so that's what I, the, the word I used before is augment. Sometimes you can put a constraint in that augments the information that occurs only very rarely in, in a real game, but you get, you're giving them more opportunity to experience it. But yeah. So I, I think that's, that's it. And understanding how people do the, the things with the task analysis is a critical first step. Yeah. Does that, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, I, just, I had a, a, a follow-up sure. based on, um, would it be safe to say then, then having youth athletes focus on, or having coaches focus on athletes make decisions in, in context is probably the, the most important aspect because you develop good decision makers as their bodies change and as the game changes, they've got that foundation to be able to adapt then to the other parts of the game. Yeah, definitely. Um, the, so yeah, I think it's, it's kind of, a, there's two uh, in decision-making and the, the, the phrase that, uh, you know, I use more is perception, actually keeping it coupled. So always, you know, making, trying as much as you can to make the, you know, the, the, what they're doing, based on what it, the information that will occur in the actual game. So, so I, I think both of those things, I would, I would think, yes, definitely. Um, like that's the problem, you know, Stuart's favorite thing to cone, to bash on cones. Like the problem I have with cones is you, there's a reason you dart to the left with the ball in football or soccer, right? There's a re- you do that because of information, <laughs> not because of a stationary orange object and what a coach tells you, to do, right? So you're, you want to, that action to be based on the information that drives it in the game. And you don't get that if you, if you couple it apart. So, but I think you're in a, in a, a point you're, you're hinting at is I think a real strength of the, uh, the constraints that approaches the, the constraint of the individual is, is cap- the growth issue that you're, you're mentioning where people's bodies changes and their abilities change. And um, that's a part of what we allow people to adapt to with these kind of things. We don't force them. You have to do the movement this way, which may not work for an, uh, you know, someone that's not that tall or not that strong yet. So, so allowing people to adapt to their own body growth and things is, I think, a, a strength of this approach as well. Great stuff. Uh, Vince, you're, you're up. You're not moving anymore, so fire away. No, I'm not moving. <laughs> okay, so one, I'm getting a ton out of this. I just want to put that out there. Um, oh, thank you. I am trying to solve kind of my own problem, which is kind of based on a principle of the biggest liar I know is me and the person who gets lied to the most is me. <laughs> um, I love playing with the constraints dials and figuring out how to make the task more representative and which affordance I want to come out and all that good stuff. And one of the things I did this year was we played a game for about a month, uh, twice a week for about a month. And we got to the end and realized it was all wrong. (laughs) And so I'm trying to figure out how long it's kind of on the back. I think the first question, how long do I stick with something um, before moving on or, try to figure out is this more the game or is this more the players needing more time to to adjust to the game yeah that's a tough that's a tough you know you know how long um 
you know, I, that's where your real expertise comes in, you know, being able to evaluate the kind of movement towards what you're looking for. So, um, so I, I, I guess what I would say is um, one of the things, expressions I like to say to coaches is, is not to just observe or watch your athletes is to track the performance to, so have a specific, what is this, what is this exercise learning exercise trying to achieve? What exactly do I want them to do? Do I want them to get rid of the ball quicker? Do I want them to make smarter passing decisions, whatever it is, and then track that, right? Be very intent be very, you know, intent as a coach as you know, this is what I want to see. And, Maybe, you know, in something that's long term, have a, a series of those, you know, I want to see this first, then hopefully that and that. So you're right, instead of just waiting for the full, you know, perfect thing to bloom, have these kind of, you know, individual things you, you want to track, and make sure you're focusing on that. And if they're not doing the other thing, okay, I'll work on that later. <laughs> but I got this, this part, right. So, so that's kind of what, what I would, I would do. But um, it is a tricky problem. Know how long to stick with things and whether, whether they're, they're working. I don't know, Stuart, you have. What, on that as well. My question was, Vince, why did you think you got it wrong? Um, you want me to kind of dig into what, what we just, tried a just, little bit or. Yeah, maybe that might help. Yeah. Okay. We were trying to get the players. The goal was to be able to, ch I'm, I'm a soccer coach. Um, and this was with, uh, under tens and the goal was to try to get them to challenge the keeper with their shooting from between 10 to 15 yards with more regularity. Uh, we did not this time try to record the session so we could have some kind of da data to go off of. I had, um, we did like a tagging game where the defenders had a ball at their feet and had to tag the players before they shot at a goal. And then we had different point systems and used some video game stuff and all of that. Mm -hmm. We found later on that what improved was their first touch ability because they had all these defenders trying to tag them. That got better. The actual shooting, the task wasn't simple enough. They weren't getting lots of shooting reps because of the amount of difficulty the taggers were presenting. Um, maybe another assistant coach keeping a better eye on me, you know, having some supervision on the head coach would have helped as well. Um, but that was kind of, we got to the end and went, well, the players don't shoot more often and they don't shoot any better from distance, although their first touches are a little better. So that's kind of what we at least thought we were seeing. Yeah. Uh, I, it's interesting. The reason I asked the question is, is because um, it, it's, I, this is where I think we can learn from the researchers, um, which is I always feel like every session is a little bit like an experiment where you've got a hypothesis and you're going to test it. <laughs> and your hypothesis is I'm going to do this activity on the basis that I think it's going to bring about a change of behavior that is the sort of change of behavior that I'm looking for. Uh, and sometimes you might need to repeat the experiment over and over again because the first time you do it, it's too much thing going on. I think the interesting thing for you maybe to reflect on here, Vince, uh, and, I, and I would love to dig into this in more detail, but I've got to be conscious of Rob's time. Rob, how are you doing for time, by the way? I'm oh, fine. Oh, yeah. okay, I've cool. got a few moments, yeah. Okay. Um, so um, the one thing I was just going to say is, is that one thing you have to be careful of is, um, is doing the design um, and were, and is the thing like the whole thing was wrong or did you just not manipulate variables well enough to be able to bring about the activity you were looking for? Like, for example, if you took the tagging away, would that have made a difference? Or if you'd have reduced numbers, would that made a difference? If you'd changed space, would that made a difference? So it may not be that the activity itself was entirely wrong. It's just maybe some of the variables weren't quite dialed in right. So that might just be. And so that's why often I think as you do more of this, Rob, please jump in at any point. Mm -hmm you start to develop more of an intuitive sense of when it's wrong. I don't, I honestly couldn't tell you, and I don't think I get this right every time and I couldn't give you a formula for that, but you begin to sense it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's that kind of the craft of coaching starts to come into play here a little bit more. I don't know if you've got any reflections on that, Rob. Yeah, no, that, that's kind of what I was trying to get at. I think that's one of your <laughs> unique knowledge that I don't have access to. to, to, to kind of, yeah, that you're not getting the kind of the basics of what you're looking for uh, in, in terms of the, the design. Um, I think, yeah, that's a, co coaches are really attuned to that, I think. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think Stuart is right playing with tweaking some of the, the variables. and Because and, and, if, if you really put a lot of thought into the basic design, like it sounds like, 
you know, putting pressure on them at certain distance. So kind of thinking through the initial design, what you want to do is kind of, you want to create an affordance for shooting from far away, right? So you want to make it attractive in some way or, you know, so, uh, you know, put, make it a penalty for going in closer, you know, the, these sort of things. so I think if you think through that original the design, I, I would try to stick with it for a while and, you know, tweak things as, as Stuart suggests. Yeah. Is that, is that helpful, Vince? No, no, that's, that's really helpful. I think that's along the lines. We definitely felt that it was too much pressure. And we also, I think, just in terms of our principle, we'll probably add later on, there was a fear element that we didn't think about in terms of the emotional response to that amount of pressure at that point in the activity that we've started to take into account. But I think that generally helps me in terms of how to, how to look at it and, and make those tweaks with the variables. So no, I appreciate that a lot. Cool. And then, and finally, we've got a final question from our uh, uh, South American rugby speci specialist, Juan Gonzalez Mendia, who I've probably, again, I've probably got the name wrong. Hopefully I've done that. De done that. Okay. Juan, Juan, uh, fire away. Hi Stuart. Hi Rob. Um, I agree with Bins there. This is, this is fantastic. Uh, and you're way too kind to it as well. Uh, nowhere near your description really. Uh, just a quick one, uh, Rob, in terms of coach education, and I noticed how I didn't say coach um, development. Mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the worst and best you've seen out there so far? Uh, I'm lucky enough to, to work with loads of coaches around the world, uh, and I'm still trying to, trying to grasp the, well, what's, what's the best way of getting a bunch of dads and mums in a room for a couple of hours and, and actually get them to believe in the approach, to believe in the ecological and constraints-led approach. Well, what are your thoughts on that? So you, you're trying to get coaches on board with, with this approach. And um, I don't know if I have a, have a, a secret. Uh, I think, I, f I find if I can get, like, w what I try to do is, you know, some, start with some basic drill, uh, you know, use, starting with cone, you know, dribbling around cones, and then try to point out what you see in that and then transition to some other like a tag drill or something like that where you show them look you can like that's a great one because you see immediate effects kids heads are up when they have the ball like it's it's a great <laughs> way to demonstrate a benefit so so i try to you know show something like that first and kind of get people oh yeah that makes a lot of sense kind of and the resonate thing we, we talked about and and um and then, yeah, I emphasize some of the things that Stuart was talking about beyond the performance things, talk about the engagement and the enjoyment factor and, and emphasize those as well. So um, I've had good luck when, when I've had the opportunity to, to jump in there with coaches. And um, I try not to be, uh, you know, uh, a jerk and just show up at practice and tell people they're doing it wrong. So I wait for an opportunity. But, but um, yeah, that, that's been my experience. I don't, is what you think, Stuart, as well. Yeah, I'm very much so. I'm um, I'm at the coal face of this, um, working within hockey and working with coaches. I actually find that mums and dads are, are only too willing to get on board. And you know what? They're amazing practitioners. And the main, main reason they're amazing practitioners is they haven't necessarily got any technical knowledge to fall back on. Mm -hmm. So the idea that actually, oh, okay, so we're going to do some passing. Oh, let's do a game that involves lots of passing. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, and I think they can get on board with that and they can really sort of think, oh, okay, great. I don't have to be like some sort of super hockey technical net, uh, technical expert or a rugby expert or a football expert. I need to be somebody who can design a dead fun game. And, and actually, they really like it. Uh, also, um, I find that using the approach that Rob's described actually is almost exactly the way we do things, which is to let them experience different forms. And, you know, sometimes I'll be very explicit in my instructions and also have a very formulaic drill where there's quite a lot of people waiting in queues and dribbling around cones and all those sorts of things. And then I'll do ex almost exactly the same thing, but there'll be, it'd be much more dynamic and everybody involved in the cone will become a human being and um, all those sorts of things. And then we just literally ask the question, you know, which was the most, which was the more fun, which was the, which, which was more challenging, which, what did you learn from that? What did you experience from that? What did you experience from that? And actually they just give you a load more rich feedback about one particular model versus another. And actually then it kind of sells itself. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Rob, you, as I mean, you, you're, you're very much the, um, uh, the epitome of what we talked about earlier in terms of the generosity with your time. Uh, oh, I really, I really yeah. appreciate, you know, I invite you to come on the podcast and then all of a sudden throw a load of 
these, I mean, as you can tell, I mean, this is an amazing group of people to just get together and talk with. I mean, I, I do this once a month and I, we have an amazing conversation every single time. I learn loads from them. They learn loads from me, mm -hmm. but uh, you're very kind to take their questions and, <laughs> and respond yeah. to them because it wasn't part of the original brief, but you've been, been very, uh, very generous. So I really appreciate that. Well, my pleasure. My pleasure too. It was a lot of fun. I, I do love questions that, Hopefully I can give some intelligent answers, but I do, I do like that. Yeah. Um, and, um, as, uh, as, as Juan was alluding to, um, Juan, by the way, um, the other thing I forgot to say, actually, if you are talking about parents, you obviously got to point them towards the perception and action podcast before they come on the course, because then it gives them the base foundational knowledge that they yes. need. <laughs> uh, Rob, um, by the way, there may be some people who, uh, you know, who are listening to this, who've never heard of you before. I find it very hard, but let's imagine <laughs> that there are. Um, how would they find out about you and also be able to track the sort of stuff that you're putting out into the, uh, into the online space? Um, probably the easiest way is, is perceptionaction.com, which is kind of the, the website I have for the podcast and also any, uh, you know, uh, pod, whatever you use to listen to podcasts. If you just search perception action podcast, you'll find it. But that website has links to my personal, all my uh, articles and some blog posts and, and things like that, that I do. So that's the easiest way to find me. And, and yeah, and, and I, like I said, I think if you like, like, uh, you know, this podcast is kind of a, I think they're very complimentary in, in a way. So, uh, yeah, I would, I would encourage you <laughs> to come on over if you have it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And of course you're very active on Twitter at shaky weights. Yes. Yeah. I'd love to know to the talk. story behind shaky weights. Tell me that. Tell me about that. So it's actually a musical. So it's a uh, combination of, um, shaky is the nickname for the two of people, artists I really like Neil Young. That's shaky is his nickname and weights is Tom Waits. Ah, <laughs> That's okay. when I, I joined Twitter at the same time I was on some music. Board. <laughs> I never thought I would use it and <laughs> I would have changed it, but you're ah, I'm stuck with it. And yeah, that's the story behind that. Yeah. Oh. So it's not as exciting as people think, but yeah, so at Twitter, I try to, what, what I try to do is uh, post a lot of links to articles that I think people will be interested in um, that are interested in this kind of skill acquisition, motor learning things. And, because uh, I get a lot of things come across my desk. So that's the main thing that I do. But then every once in a while, I'll jump into some argument. <laughs> about yeah. and, and immediately regret that you did so. Yes, yes, <laughs> usually. <Yeah. laughs> Waste an hour later after I've not been doing what I was supposed to. Yeah. Yeah, I feel I feel you. Um, yeah. I, I like, I, Rob, I just want to reiterate, I think it's been great to have you on. And actually, I think uh, it's also been fantastic to, uh, you know, kind of get everybody to sort of be, you know, have this sort of learning space that we we have. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully everybody who's been on board has been uh, has been very, uh, very appreciative. I know. I know that they will all say thank you to you in their in their own way at some point. By all means, guys, reach out to Rob and, and drop him a line and and let him know uh, you know your appreciation. Um, Rob, conscious that you know there's probably some students that you need to be going teaching or something along those lines. So I don't want to hold you up any further. But um, once again, uh, thank you very much. Keep up, but obviously keep it coming because you know. Uh, if you, I suppose you're a bit like me now, you can't stop, can you? You know, it's yeah, yeah. It, you set a precedent, you kind of yeah. But I, I really do enjoy it. So, and I really thank you. I, this was a lot of fun. So, thank you Great. very much. Okay, and uh, so um, as as you always say, uh, your catchphrase is keep them coupled. Mine is ditch those drills. But um, <laughs> hopefully, uh, for everybody out there, we'll um, uh, the, we'll have you on again in in some short period of time, and uh, and uh, we'll you can share with us some of the the stuff that you're finding, and maybe some of the practitioners will play back to you some of their field notes. Yeah, that sounds great. And any questions? Questions are good for me for thinking of topic ideas. So uh, you know, I'm happy to take those as well. Okay, Rob. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Talent Equation podcast. If you like the show, then please consider supporting it by leaving a review on your favorite podcast player, telling your friends about it, or even becoming a hero and show your appreciation by becoming a patron. Just head over to the talentequation.co.uk and click on the Becoming a Patron button at the top of the page. So there you have it. Uh, I think it worked. I think the uh, experiment of uh, getting 
getting Rob in a room with uh, members of the Conclave seemed to go pretty well. Um, had a had a really a really great conversation, and uh, I think the feedback from the guys who were who were bit, who were there in the room was that it was just fantastic to be able to have somebody with as much knowledge as Rob, um, and just be you know how open and uh, and and responsive to their questions uh, he was. So um, one of my big takeaways from that that I think uh, has resonated in a big way is this whole idea of the differential learning um, being that kind of eating from a buffet and going wherever you want to versus constraints which is much more about providing that uh, providing the right kind of alternatives before we then moved into other parts of the buffet that's a real real big reference point from from my perspective um, yeah thanks a lot Rob I really appreciate you coming on uh, I think all the work you do with uh, with perceptionaction.com and, and, and the podcast is fantastic and it's a a really valuable resource certainly for me and i know i know a lot of people out there uh, think the same way as well so uh more power to you um i wanted to just say uh, a big thanks to um all the people who've, who've come on board as patreon supporters uh, of, of recent times um really appreciate that there are a couple of spots available in the conclave if you want to uh, take advantage of opportunities such as speaking to the likes of rod rob gray uh, it is limited uh, do i will have to close it eventually but uh, there are a few spaces available if you want to take advantage of those in the meantime um have a great week i'll see you in seven days time and remember Ditch those drills.